All right, today we're going to continue looking at optical properties of ceramics. Uh, in particular, we're going to start with how ceramics can get their color. So there's a number of ways that this can happen, um, and we are going to talk about three ways. So don't let me don't uh, think that there's only a couple uh, ways that that ceramics can get their colors, but these are some of the the, the common ways. And so. Uh, this can occur by uh, electronic transitions. So basically when a photon of light interacts with a ceramic, um, it can be absorbed uh, and that can induce uh, an electron to transfer from one space to another with that absorbed energy. And um, that transition then manifests itself as a release of a photon uh, in a specific wavelength, which corresponds to the visible range. And so we get coloration. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about um, transition metal ions. Uh, the in local environment that they are in can cause these uh, transitions. Um, also, something that we've talked about before, um, a trapped uh, electron, um, which is a defect, uh, can be uh, referred to as a color center because it produces uh, radiation reduction, uh, which results in visible light. And the third one, uh, which we've also talked about, but in other applications, uh, is secondary phases. So we mentioned that um, these uh, the particles um, can scatter light, uh, and we can use that to characterize the size uh, of the light. So secondary phases at a particular size scale, similar to the wavelength of visible light, can produce uh, visible light. So here you kind of see that the incident uh, light has a wavelength of red light, and then it's scattered and it becomes blue light through this scattering uh, absorption phenomenon. And so this is another way that we can have this happen. Okay, so the color of ceramics is strongly dependent on very small amounts of dopants and impurities. And so typically, these are transition metal ions. So as kind of a um, uh, sort of a proof of this, or just to give you an example, um, consider corundum. So you may know corundum as uh, alumina, or Al2O3, aluminum oxide. And this is a ceramic uh, known uh, to be an insulator uh, in a very traditional ceramics that's used for a lot of insulating uh, materials. Um, as a single crystal or a gemstone, it is clear, as you see here. Um, so very clear. Um, but if we add even parts per million amounts of various ions, so chromium or nickel, we can change, so we're not changing the structure, it's still Al2O3, but we're adding very small amounts uh, of these materials. And with that, we get this strong coloration. So with chromium, we tend to get this red color. Uh, nickel here gives blue, but can give green and other applications uh, as well. So just really small amounts of these dopants or impurities uh, can result in that. And so this is very evident in gemstones when you, when you think about different gemstones. Okay, so I want to spend some time and discuss the theory that can help us understand how a transition metal um, in a specific environment can cause these colorations. And so what we're going to talk about is known as ligand field theory or LFT sometimes for short. If you hear that, that's what we're talking about. But first, let me explain to you what a ligand is. And so here, a ligand is a negative charged, non-spherical environment around a transition metal ion. So let's say we added that chromium or nickel. And so here I just put it as the more generic MN+, so some metal ion. Um, so it's obviously a cation. And so in that ceramic, it's going to be coordinated by uh, anions, and those are obviously going to be negative. So in this case, these anions are, are ligands, and it's non-spherical because it forms uh, in this octahedral surrounded by six, right? So you can see all six of these uh, anions. Uh, and so this is a non-spherical environment because they, uh, the ligands are in specific 
uh, arrangements. So that's what we mean by a ligand. Okay, and so we use this ligand field theory because it can explain the coloration that we get when we introduce um, these uh, transition metal um, ions. And it can also, one of the maybe more important aspects, you know, because not uh, understanding the coloration of gemstones is, is nice and everything, but the magnetic properties uh, can also be explained by the same theory. So keep, in, keep that in mind that we're going to kind of talk about coloration, but it also explains other properties uh, that may be more useful for sort of practical ceramics. Okay, and so what we're going to look at is... Um, we're going to think about this transition metal ion and we're going to think about it as an isolated ion. So what it would be like in isolation. And then we're going to compare what that is in different ligand fields. And so these are going to be our different coordinations for lack of a better word, right? So we're going to look at uh, how it is uh, isolated, how it would be if we had a perfect um, uh, spherical symmetry around it which we don't see in these cases, uh, and then compare it to what it would be like in octahedral and tetrahedral site. And so this kind of brings together a lot of concepts we've talked about through the semester, why we looked at um, you know, the electronic uh, band structure and so forth. It was to kind of to get us to be able to, to understand this. And so this is going to be looking at what happens in these coordination sites. And what we're going to see is that the d orbitals, those orbitals that can hold 10 electrons and have uh, five orbitals, we're going to see that instead of all of those existing at the same energy state, which would be the case in spherical, we're going to see that some orbitals lower in energy and some raise in energy. So this is based, the y-axis here is basically an arbitrary sort of relative energy. And so we're gonna see what we call splitting of the d orbital. And this is what uh, tells us about those electron transitions and tells us if there's gonna be coloration. Um, I also put this table here from the book um, and it kind of shows you the connection between d electrons, what ion we have, and the coordination and then what color it obtains. So just to sort of, before we sort of get any further with this, I just want to point out that uh, we're going to go over this, but I'm not going to expect that um, if I give you uh, an element like chromium 3 plus, uh, I'm not going to expect that you can kind of derive what color that would be because there's a number of factors that we're not going to talk about. What I want you to be able to get is if I give you a certain ion or number of d electrons in a certain configuration, you'd be able to tell me if you expect it to have coloration or if it would be the base color of that material so no transitions occur. So that's kind of the level that I want you to have is basically yes or no kind of question here. All right, so let's look at an ion placed in this ligand field. And let's start with octahedral coordination. So imagine the center of this box um, is our positive ion and you can see here that I've basically drawn the uh, d orbitals for that ion, right? So the plus minus of those uh, lobes is not referring to charge but the sign of the um, the uh, Schrodinger wave equation, right? So plus minus in those is referring to that. And so then, uh, oops, excuse me. Uh, and so then each of these uh, blue spheres that I've drawn are negatively charged and those are our negatively charged ligands. So when, and, and I put them in a certain spatial arrangement to show you octahedral coordination, right? So we have one here, one here, and then four in plane, right? So that's octahedral coordination, uh, something that we should be familiar with, right? And what you see here is that the lobes of the d orbitals match up with certain, um, or sorry, the uh, ions here, the ligands, match up with specific d orbitals. And so in this case, 
the two that they match up with are the ones that are um, at the center of the faces, right? So this one, this one, this one, and this one, and that, and this one, and this one, and that, that corresponds to the dx squared minus y squared, and also the dz squared orbitals, right? So those match up. And because those line up with the ions, it means that those are repulsed stronger, right? They're closer, or sorry, they're repelled stronger because they're closer uh, to those ions. All right, so what that does is it increases the energy relative to the isolated, or sorry, relative to spherical coordination. So the repulsion of the z squared and the x squared minus y squared puts them at a higher energy. So basically this energy level, the dashed line, represents the spherical coordination. And then this represents octahedral. So it's pushed the energy because again, y axis here is energy. And so it's pushed these uh, x squared minus y squared and the z squared to a higher energy state. And so since we have uh, two orbitals there, those two orbitals get pushed to a higher energy state. What that does is the others that are, um, that are uh, basically not as well lined up. Um, so this would be the xy, the yz, and the y, uh, yz. All of those which are not really lined up with the um, the uh, d orbitals uh, effectively now get lowered ener energy. So those get pushed to a lower energy state. So the the sum of all of these has to balance to the energy of the spherical coordination. So that's uh, uh, something that we have to see. So this is just like molecular orbitals where we had an antibonding and a bonding. The sum of those would equal the um, the it in the absence of that state, which here is the spherical symmetry. And so the addition of the electrons in these plus the electrons in these would balance to the energy of this. Uh, but this is showing that the ions and the the ones that are off axis, so y, uh, x, y, y, z, x, z, are pushed to lower energy state and the others to a higher energy state. Okay, so now let's look at the other coordination, tetrahedral. So here, again, I've represented the d orbitals in the box and then the blue spheres as the tetrahedral coordinated uh, anions. And so those are going to be at the corners of the box in alternating sites. And so those match up now really well with these off-axis ones, right? Because they are at those off-axis positions like yz, xz, and xy. And so now those are repulsed stronger. And so that means that they're going to be pushed uh, so now we're in tetrahedral, so they get pushed to a higher energy state. And then the others, the x squared and the x, or z squared and the x squared minus y squared, those get uh, lowered in energy state in this case because they don't line up with those um, lobes. And so those are pushed to a lower energy state because there's not as much repulsion, because we're talking about electrons here, electrons with uh, interacting with these negative ligands. And so those off excess ones gets pushed to a lower energy state, right? So we're sort of illustrating the why we see the splitting in the specific way that we do, because um, the ones that are at the higher energy state are repulsed because they are, are in closer uh, uh, spatial relationship to each other, as the, whereas the other ones are not as close, and so they get pushed to a lower energy state with the sum of that equaling what's in the spherical symmetry. Okay, so now what I'm going to have you do is um, take a look at some specific uh, element ions. Uh, and so this, again, kind of goes back to the beginning and other courses when we talked about electronic configuration. So based on these four ions, 
uh, you should be able to write out the electron configuration and what is in the d orbital and you're going to uh, sketch the orbital splitting of those uh, four ions and you're going to do it for octahedral which we talked about and tetrahedral so if you forget what that is make sure you go back and look at those splittings and what we're going to do after that after you sketch them is we're going to see which of these we expect to uh, have a transition and which of those then would give us a color so i'm going to sort of have you uh, guess on those last two based on you know we haven't talked about that specifically yet so um, take a uh, take a few minutes to to look at that and see if you can sketch out those uh, splittings and then see if you can predict what you think is going to have a configuration uh, transition and then what is going to cause color and we'll talk about these um, here after the break all right so let's sort of go through these one by one and see what we have. So we're going to start with the first one, so scandium, and this is scandium 3+. Plus. And so if we look at the configuration, so hopefully you got the same configuration here. So it's argon, the configuration of argon, plus 3d0. So in this case, we have zero d orbital electrons. And so if there's no... Uh, electrons in the d orbital then there's no splitting right so there's nothing in these filled boxes so each one of these represents one of the orbitals with a maximum of, of 10 electrons and then since we have zero um, you wouldn't ex expect any splitting because there's no electrons and therefore there would be no transition for electrons and therefore we would have no color all right, so that's kind of a, a false one. So, so when we see scandium 3+, plus, those types of crystals, they tend to be colorless and therefore kind of clear uh, in these cases. So these are some uh, crystals. I, I don't know specifically what scandium compound it is, but it's a scandium 3+, plus compound. And you see that the crystals here are clear uh, crystals uh, of this material. All right, so now let's look at titanium and specifically titanium 3+. Plus. So if you got the same thing I did, you should get argon 3d1. So basically now we have one d electron. So this at least gives us something to work with, right? So again, we have a possibility of 10 sites. So we're gonna fill one of them uh, with an electron. And so here, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we have one electron. And so we can in fact uh, have d orbital splitting. And so here, in this case, uh, we have the x, y, y, z, and z, uh, z, x uh, here at the bottom. And so if we go back, that tells us that we are in octahedral, right? So this is octahedral coordination here. So if we have the one electron here, um, then everything else is blank. And so this has the potential for an electron transition, and it in fact produces a material a titanium three plus materials tend to be colored and in this case this one is violet again you shouldn't um we haven't talked enough about um how to get to that color right but at least from here we should be able to say this should give us some color um okay so let's kind of explain a little bit more about why we get color all right so imagine we have this it's in this octahedral coordination we, that we show here we have one uh, d electron it's going to go to the 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 lowest energy site first so this site so that's kind of reduced the energy overall by doing this by being in the octahedral configuration and what happens here is again if we hit this material with some type of wavelength of energy what can happen is we can basically promote this electron right this electron becomes energized and can uh, jump the gap to one of the other energy states right so this electron can basically transition to one of these sites and that has a specific energy level based on the material and the transition that we have here and so that specific change in energy would result um, in uh, the energy corresponding to a particular wavelength so imagine we promoted this uh, electron but now it's no longer at the lowest energy site. So it would wanna go back 
to the low energy site. And then just like we see with uh, energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy, so EDS, that transition in energy would result in a lessening of the energy and that would result in a wavelength. So with EDS, that was the result. Uh, the result was an x-ray. Here, the result is a visible photon. And so in this case, it'd be a, a violet colored light. So that energy corresponds to violet uh, radiation, right? So that transition is what causes it. So if we can have a transition, if there's the ability for an electron to go from a high energy site back to the low energy, that is what causes this color transition. All right, so now let's look at copper. So copper two plus in particular, um, again, if you um, got the same thing I did, you should get argon plus 3D9. So we're almost completely filled here with the D electrons. So we have, but we have one spot left. So one spot left means that there's still room for transition, right? So we can still promote one of these electrons to the higher energy state. Uh, in this case, the X squared minus Y squared or the Z squared, and then it could go back and create um, uh, light. And so in this case, with copper two plus, um, these compounds with copper two plus tend to be blue because that's the amount of energy uh, between these two energy states. But again, you have to know a lot more about uh, the material, uh, the local environment, the ligand field, before you can actually calculate the, um, the amount of energy and therefore the color. So basically, um, I just want you to be able to say, uh, see that there's an uh, empty site, therefore you can have a transition, and that can give you color. Uh, the, the, the actual color is not something that we can calculate right now. All right, so let's look at the last example that I gave you there. Uh, and this was zinc two plus. So zinc two plus, again, if you've got your electron configuration, uh, should be 3D10, same argon configuration. And so if it's got 3D10, that's full. Everything is full. If it undergoes splitting, uh, then it will also be full. And so in this case, there is no ability for an electron to go from one to the other because everything is full up. And so there's no transition and therefore <coughs> Excuse me, just like the empty d orbitals, there's also no color in this. So, zinc compounds, uh, zinc 2 plus of this sort, tend to also be um, clear or colorless. So that's kind of the level that I want you to be able to, to figure out. Um, again, the actual color is not something that we can calculate right now. But again, if you sort of go through these various ions, you'll see the number that we have, and that should correspond. Uh, in this case, all of these are, are between 0 and 10, uh, and so we should get transitions for them, and so that will give us uh, different colors. But again, it depends on the ion, the host material, so whether it's corundum or whatever, uh, the crystal structure, the interactions, so there's a lot that goes into what actually determines that color.